Well, welcome today. All right, how are we doing? Tired? Okay. All right. Any highlights or lowlights for the weekend? Went to prom. Woodbury prom. Okay, so that was at the Landmark Center. Okay. And that one okay? All right. All right. So that's huge. Um, they had like two waves. In. Yes, she she did. She chose not to go. Instead, uh, uh, we uh, we all went out for dinner that night. You know, so that was kind of like going to be like her formal going out for dinner. So it it was fun. It was fun. So so that would be a highlight. It was first time that like, the Newcomb family went to like a. Um, a sit down restaurant. We'll just say that. My son would probably have been happy if we just went to McDonald's, but no. Okay. So we got prom. Anyone else? Any good highlights? Oh. Maybe maybe stuff that you can't share. That's all right. All right. Okay. Maybe maybe you know it's it's the Las Vegas thing. You know what happens wherever it was going on. All right. But. Uh, to go with it, you go ahead. Or friends over for that's huge. That's huge when you allow to have friends over. Okay. All right. Um, and hopefully we'll see more of that, right? In these weeks to come and all that stuff. You know, as more more um, as we perhaps get more vaccinated or we just feel things are getting getting better all right um to go along with you know maybe for the highlight for the weekend is going to that restaurant um uh, it was restaurants called holman's table which is in the uh, airport the old airport of at holman's field in st paul and uh, but to get there though uh, we had to go through a national uh, guards uh, checkpoint, which, as we pulled up, we're like, interesting. You know, it's it's at the airport, and that just reminded me that uh, throughout the Twin Cities, uh, Operation Safety Net is um, in action. And why would we have Operation Safety Net in action? What's that? First time hearing about it. Okay. Well, we we pulled up, you know, and I, I slowed down and rolled down the window and just said, hey, we're just going to go to the restaurant right over there. And she's like, hey, no problem. Just go ahead. Go ahead. But you look over to the right and you see all the military vehicles all lined up. And by the time we left the restaurant, many of those vehicles have left because they're engaging in Operation Safety Net. Right? But there is a reason that they are in action. Anyone want to speculate? Yes, it's because of uh, George Floyd trial and the riots. Now, Operation Safety Net was going to have been enacted a little bit sooner than they hoped. And a lot of it has to do because of Dante Wright, with the, the shooting of Dante Wright. Um, and this is a response. And one could say a learn uh, a lesson learned from the riots about a year ago about maybe having quicker response. So, but it still was a little unsettling to see the the, the checkpoint and um, they're packing heat. All right, and so it, you know, they've got their they've got their their weapons there with them. And so it's, it's a little unsettling, unsettling in that. So around the Twin Cities, you do see the National Guard in action. How does that make you feel? I mean, have, have, have you left the Cottage Grove and gone out into the greater metropolitan area and seen them? Okay. How does that make you feel when you see the National Guard? Something happened. Well, I, of course, yes, but something big. 
something big or they're trying to prevent something big from happening. What do you got? Okay, trying to get ahead of that. That's huge as well. That's right. Those at home, you feel free to share in the chat or un unmute if you want. Um, and so I think it, it, it does highlight, you know, the what what we are experiencing here. I mean, this is a big week for us in Minnesota um, because this week in Minnesota, uh, the the jury for the Chauvin trial will be in deliberations. And the, we're going to be anxious in Minnesota, as well as the nation will be anxious. Depending on that outcome, uh, could uh, have a ripple effect throughout the United States. And maybe internationally, because we saw with George Floyd, um, it wasn't just local. It was national and international reaction. All right. And... Um, I mean, what would what what might happen if he's not convicted? A lot of people will be angry. A lot of people will be angry. Absolutely. Will there be a potential for a riot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I remember when George Floyd riot was going on for the amount of days. And I'm, I'm texting back and forth with my, my, my mentor, and we are talking about how this is compared to uh, the race riots of 92. And then he threw in there the, the riots of the, of the 1960s, and I just kind of text back, I can't speak of that because I was in diapers, I have no idea you know, what the heck that was going on. But how, how the the rioting of 92 was very similar to the rioting of last year yeah um i said something interesting this weekend i didn't talk to the riot but i live by the competition council okay and i drove past there at like 10 p.m and there were a group of like 10 men drinking beers with drunk flags all right. Just having a little social gathering in the in the kind of yeah, CG Cup parking lot. So it's it's possible that you know they're they're that they're taking upon themselves to protect the the cup foods um, or taking a moment to have a few beverages in, in, in the cup parking lot. That's very very interesting, but. Again, one thing that we did see perhaps as, as a result of the George Floyd riot is citizen groups possibly doing that uh, to protect local businesses, taking it upon themselves, which they are acting outside of the law to do stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Minnesota, uh, if, we, if we look at history, Minnesota does not have a I, uh, well, we do not necessarily convict um, police officers. So we'll see how this plays out. And so Operation Safety Net in many ways is a preemptiveness, I guess, to try to maybe minimize uh, the amount of rioting that might occur. See how it plays out. Now, someone in another hour brought up about uh, the incident in uh, Hutchinson and how that was handled differently. Does anyone know what happened in Hutchinson, Minnesota? See, this is where we gotta somehow sometimes gotta pay attention to to the news. Well, in Hutchinson, there was a uh, gentleman who uh, refused to wear his mask in the Menards, Hutchinson. And uh, they refused to sell him his merchandise. Guy got angry and assaulted the clerk. And the police were called. All right, 60 year old um, white male uh, assaults the clerk. 
He then proceeds to leave Menards and they engage in what they call a slow speed chase. All right, so not a high speed chase, but slow speed chase. So that, 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 you know, I can visualize that, you know, kind of like a couple, you know, a turtle and stuff like that. But um, still, I mean, that's the only humor I would say in this whole thing, slow speed chase. They did eventually stop him, pinned him in, but the guy takes out a hammer and assaults a police officer. Here you have all the police officers, and a hammer comes out, and the police officer gets assaulted. Um, the guy's arrested and charged. What are some people thinking? What? Right. So if it was a person of color, perhaps would be different. Uh, that person may be charged because that person might be dead. So here you have, again, uh, the calling into police team. You know, why is it happening in one place, not the same in the other, and granted different cities and all that stuff, but still, um, when we look at how charged the environment is. Ooh, big stuff. Big stuff. All right. All right. So... So I'm supposed to bring some highlights in. And then we got some heavy heart, you know, heavy duty stuff, but that's it's it's important. Uh, and so the next couple of weeks is gonna be a little charged. But anything we learn, we'll work through it. We'll work through it, we'll get through it. And I always think my mom at this point, no matter how difficult things got, she's her response is, Don't worry, we're gonna get through it. Don't worry, we'll get through it. And it's like, okay, mom. All right, we're gonna get through it. All right, we will. We'll get through it. All right. Question about that. Anything else? KK, anything? No? All right. Okay. So here we go. Some more heavy duty stuff here, or maybe some good stuff. Here we are at the end of the trimester this week. And so um, uh, just be aware of that. And if you miss anything, let's be sure we get the stuff in. And, and like I said last week, they did put this in my mailbox. This is put uh, senior holds. So if you are missing anything, um, there's a good chance that your name will appear on this list. All right, so let's avoid the list. You know, remember we're talking about like, you know, the lists for the Cold War. Here's the purple list. All right, let's avoid that. Avoid our name getting on the purple list here. I got to turn that in May 3rd, so for trimester 3.1. So if you get your name on that list, that means you, you might not have gotten a decent grade. So let's avoid the list. And we'll do that same thing for 3.2, 3.2. All right, so let's take care of that business. So today, I want us to begin the process of putting some closure to the Cold War. It's an ideological war between us and the Soviet Union and you have the Cold War crises. All right, and you worked on that, so hopefully you got it done, you submitted it, you did it on paper, put it in the basket up here. Fantastic. That's the summative piece. So let's take care of that business there. All right, look at all these Cold War crises. Um, there are some big ones in that group, all right? Cuba probably stands out as a major one. So that one, that was the closest to where either Khrushchev or Kennedy pushed the button. And Castro was willing to sacrifice Cuba for the socialist revolution. He's like, we will be sacrificed in order for socialism to succeed. That's huge. That's extraordinary. To, and maybe that's when Nikita Khrushchev and Kennedy thought, oh, this guy's he's a little out there. Maybe we need to come together and talk it out. So that's a big one. And, of course, Berlin is always a big, big issue as well. All right. So, but what that, what the Cold War crises highlights is that there is problems uh, out there and perhaps maybe bigger problems for the Soviet Union and the uh, communist world. Because they're, they're trying to project themselves as uh, this is going to be a paradise. Now, those in the West are going to realize, hey, you know, life isn't also rosy in the West as well. We've got a lot of issues in the West, a lot of flaws, okay? 
Um, and at times acknowledged the cause. But to the Soviet Union and to Eastern Bloc, they're really trying to showcase this is the, the right way of living. So I got a little video clip here. We're going to start off with that a little video clip, and then we'll go from there about the collapse of, of communism. Any questions before we start? Whenever, what's that? How long? Maybe about 10 minutes. All right. Try not to be too long. All right, let me, let me cue it up here. Well, after years of blind acceptance, millions of people have finally. All right. Here we go. They're taking the hammer to the uh, Berlin Wall, all that stuff. What happens if they fall off it? You remember what, what's on the other side. You've got automatic weapons. You've got landmines. You've got dogs that are really taking part of you out. So they're rocking it. But you got to be careful. Don't fall over. That's what I was thinking, you know, when I saw They stood up. In the 1970s, the Soviet system was at the height of its power. Each year on the anniversary of the October Revolution, they celebrated an idea still expected to transform the world. Soviet television interviewed Nina Motova as a hero of socialist labor. We marched closest to the mausoleum, so proud because our region and our factory were always considered the best. We paraded our ball bearings. The watch factory showed their new watches. Each factory displayed their achievements. We were so proud our country was so powerful. We felt like one beating heart. The communist world stretched from the Pacific in the east to the heart of Europe. Poles, Czechs, Romanians and East Germans were all seen as part of the same great family. In Berlin, Mike Fernl carried the banner for the district of Lichtenberg. Everybody was marching in the same direction, towards the sun. If I was tired or depressed, those songs gave me a lift. They gave me a real push. The future lay onwards and upwards powered by the Brotherhood of Socialism. A socialist Superman was creating a better world, all in the name of Lenin. The fabulous vision inspired new generations of schoolchildren. We were everything. We had the best tractors, the best schools. Everything was the best here. We never had any doubts. Dasha Khubova, the Russian fairy tale about an all-knowing king who could see into every home, 
was very real. I believe Brezhnev also sent his head around the city. I could see his head there instead of the king's. Of course I loved him. I couldn't help loving him. He was our king. Every night I sat up in my bed half asleep with my curtains open and I saluted Brezhnev. I imagined his head was somewhere near looking at me. And I saluted so he'd know good people lived here. <laughs> The state planned for everything. People's lives were mapped out for them in a system that claimed to provide the care and stability that capitalism never could. Our state was an example for the whole world. No unemployment, free health care and free schooling. Everything was organized, for everyone down to the youngest child. It was all planned in advance, even how many bearings would be sent to which factory. And by the 1970s, the central planners were attempting to produce everything a modern consumer might demand. Jako Aleníka v říši divů se budete cítit v obchodních domech Prior. Z nepřeberné nabídky zboží našeho trhu se vám zatočí hlava. Bendy! Schnell! Ausdauernd und robust. Ihr zuverlässiger Begleiter, der neue Trabant 601. As a skilled worker in one of Czechoslovakia's biggest factories, Petr Miller's standard of living was rising. I had a car and a cottage. I knew that they had Mercedes in the West. Yes, it's a great car, but they're both cars and they both get you from A to B. Party control of all newspapers and television meant people heard only the good news, the propaganda of success. Za 25 let socialistického zemědělství se zvýšila výroba o 70%. Decisions were made for you somewhere else. The party newspaper told you what to think. All we could do was chat over a beer, and we were far more interested in sport. It was the world of mass illusion, in which the individual was part of the whole, and the whole part of the individual. There I am, below the letter E. I remember how terrified we were to get it right, not to put up the wrong card, because Ceausescu was there in front of us. And for him, everything had to be perfect. When Romania's president Ceausescu was shown visiting markets, Mihai Radu knew the displays of food had little to do with real life. The truth is that the shops didn't even have one hundredth of what we used to see on TV. There was little food. No meat, butter, milk, no cheese. Across the Soviet bloc, communist economic planning wasn't delivering. Queuing became a way of life.
Norocul meu a fost că My good fortune was that my grandparents were still alive. I remember my grandfather would take a little stool down to the shop where he would sit all night until the shop opened the next morning. That was when the Romanian proverb was coined. If you don't have a granny, you better buy one. People spent up to five hours a day in line. The wait for a flat was 15 years. But the party still tried to persuade them that life was far worse in the capitalist West. Um, because kind of sets the stage here. But when we look at that little clip here, um, any, anything that kind of stands out, anything take away about life in the communist bloc? How does it remind you of China's propaganda? Okay, not so good. Um, well, in the communist world, they're, they're, they're projecting that they are creating a, a paradise. Everything is provided for them. All right. So, but just in that little clip, what are we seeing? Is everything provided for them? No, it's not. You see them stay in line. Does that kind of remind you of anything? Maybe about a year ago? What, what are you going to say? Okay, America's Great Depression, where you're receiving soup. Yeah, I was thinking about you know standing at uh, at line at uh, Valley Fair, you know, waiting to get on a ride. Um, no, but you know, you're right. It reminds us of of that era of the soup lines and hoping that or hoping to get a job, standing outside the unemployment office. Definitely. Uh, or even like, you know, if we fast forward a year ago, waiting outside of Target to rush in and, and, and get your uh, ration of, uh, of uh, toilet paper or paper towels or Kleenexes or whatever it might be, you know? So, uh, because of supplies. But in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Bloc, short supplies was common. It was very common. Unless you're actually a car carry member of the Communist Party, then you had a different place you could go. And those restaurant or those um, uh, stores are going to be stocked differently. But for most people who weren't card carry members, uh, they had to wait in line for toilet paper. They wait in line for meat, the basic necessities. And it's not that they didn't have it. It's just that getting it from making it to the market, the structure that they had uh, wasn't able to provide for the, the supply and demand or demand and supply. So it's there. I mean, there, there's fruit that's being grown, but it's a matter of getting it from the orchard to the market. There's try to be produced, but it's a matter of just getting it from from loose produced it to the market. State planning became very inefficient. That's huge. And it is those things that are going to contribute to the collapse of communism, which then also brings a collapse to the Cold War. Because if the Soviet Union, who is your main adversary in the Cold War, isn't around anymore, then the Cold War ceased to exist in many ways. So all this is kind of interrelated and connected with each other. Big stuff. All right. Any other thoughts here? Right. Yes, and that is by design. That's totally by design. Um, 
And so if I know that I got a job, that I'm going to have the basic needs all provided for me, at least I'm told that, I don't really have to think much. It's more process, more reaction, or just, just doing it. So yeah, that, I mean, that's huge. There, there are going to be groups that will oppose, and, and we're going to take a look at, at that today, is how those groups who are opposing and how it plays out in places like Poland and Czechoslovakia and East Germany, and even within the Soviet Union. Because eventually, it, it can only go so long. And people are going to want change. They're going to want change, right? And so with that, um, I just want to highlight a few things before we get into it. Uh, review maybe some of those things that we did last week or previous weeks, and then uh, get to the, to the challenging aspect, uh, which was the collapse here. At the end of World War II, we know that Joseph Stalin created uh, his buffer zone in Eastern Europe. Red Army's there. And so from 45 to 48, Soviet control of Eastern Europe meant this. One party rule, Moscow trained leaders, um, nationalization of private indus ind uh, industry or enterprise, Soviet style five year plans, agriculture collectivized and integration of the economy into the Soviet Union. All right, Comic Con is the organization that's going to do that. So Joseph Stalin is gonna work on creating his buffer. And this buffer is going to be to benefit the Soviet Union. First is the primary. Now, the containment, as we know, is going to um, really be backed up by strong arm tactics, as mentioned in the video clip a little bit. Uh, politically coordinated by, from Moscow, you have secret police. Of course, every country in the Eastern Bloc is going to have secret police. Um, in, in East Germany, they, they would kid and say, oh, about 50% of the German population in East Germany were part of the Stasi. And um, would have some very interesting ways, uh, like the Stasi, they had these things called smell jars, where they have scent from uh, the people that they would bring in. They, they would keep their... Uh, some belongings, just in case, if they have to go find the person. Censorship of all media, so again, controlling our thought, and uh, Soviet military presence, the Red Army is everywhere in these countries, and political purges, the, high class, uh, the showcase trials to get rid of opponents. And we'll see that happen, uh, and, and you did in the Cold War uh, crises activity, depending on which ones you picked, like in Czechoslovakia or Hungary. Uh, the purging of the leaders. In Czechoslovakia, Dubček, he actually gets purged, but he is one of the rare ones that lives. Because he comes back in the 1980s. He makes a return when uh, the Civic Forum and uh, the Velvet Revolution is successful in Czechoslovakia. Uh, so from 1945, there will be attempts to challenge the Soviet system, but it's going to fail because they're going to have strong arm tactics like in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. You send in the tanks. You send in the Warsaw Pact nations. And um, usually when it's man versus tank, tank wins. Typically. All right. Unless in the case of Tiananmen Square where the tank went around the guy. All right. Now, there are going to be uh, containment cracks, though, and we're going to start seeing those cracks in the 70s and the 80s, and that's what our our activities is going to really focus on is what's causing the cracks like uh you know and and it's occurring uh throughout the eastern Bloc countries it's not just occurring in let's say poland uh these efforts may not be coordinated though it's not like it's mass um, uprising they may not be coordinated but they're aware of what's happening in czechoslovakia Again, you got the Civic Forum, East Germany, you've got some uh, reformists finding uh, communists, just like in Hungary, Poland, you've got a trade union called Solidarity. Um, Solidarity. Solidarity was so huge. I mean, you know you're huge when you have a, a booth at the Minnesota State Fair. Because I remember uh, going, going to the State Fair, proud to pop in hand, 
because I don't get corn dogs, I get prana pups. And um, we, dad makes sure, because my dad was a uh, construction worker and he was a member of the IBEW. And he's like, you know, we got to stop by. We got to, we got, we got to listen to what the solidarity people have to say. And so, uh, in Minnesota, we had a large, we have a large Polish uh, community, and so that's also why. And uh, uh, hear their message. And yeah, it's about trade union, but it was also about, you know, Lauren had about opening up free thought. And in this case, solidarity is going to be the kind of the catalyst or the, the vehicle to get that moving. Um, but why, why is it happening? Why are these cracks happening? Remember under Khrushchev, he does allow for opening of some thought. And they were not creating these mass gulags like Stalin had, a quest for a better standard of living. It's like some people, they wanna wear, they wanna wear Levi's. You know, they wanna wear Levi's. You know, which which was big. I mean, it, the the thought was, you know, if you're going to go to the Soviet Union, you you have two suitcases. You have a suitcase that has your luggage in it, your normal stuff, and maybe another suitcase stuff that you could probably, you know, illegally sell on the black market, like Levi jeans, make some good money. I would not do that. Do not. I would not advocate. But that's what black market. That's what people wanted. You know, they wanted that better standard of living, uh, political choices. They want it more than just the, the 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 communist trained politician who's looking out for the sake of the party and not necessarily for the country, and they wanted some social freedoms. They want to be able to move. They want to be able to move. They they don't want uh, have the wire there. They want to be able to move from Hungary to Austria, or from East Germany to West Germany, to walk through the Brandenburg Gate into West Berlin. They want that. They want some social freedoms. And they want to be able to listen to Mr. Music without worrying about being arrested. You know, they want to listen to Michael J. Jackson. Maybe. All right. Now, how is this? What's going to happen here is more changes in how the superpower nations treat each other. So we are going to have some leadership changes in the 1980s. Um, after three Soviet leaders die between 1982 and 1985, so you have Brezhnev, who passes on. He, he had been Soviet leader for probably since about like 64, 65, dies in 82. Then Andropov, he, he survives for a couple years, and then he dies, and then you got Konstantin Chernenko, and then he dies in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev takes over, and he's kind of like a kid meaning he's in his um, uh, late 50s, early 60s, when we talk about him being a kid. And then you got Ronald Reagan take over as president because uh, Jimmy Carter is not going to be successful. And Ronald Reagan takes over. So we got some leadership changes, and they bring different styles. But they do agree that this Cold War in some ways is um, weighing heavy on not only their nations but also on the world. There are going to be some changes that Mikhail Gorbachev is going to bring in because, as the video has pointed out, there are some structural problems and people are dissatisfied. So Mikhail Gorbachev is going to try to address some of those issues, but that means he wants to focus more at home. So those in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and all those other places, in many ways, they're kind of left alone to do what they want. And those communist leaders in East Germany and Poland realize if they pick up the phone, Mikhail Gorbachev is going to say, it's not my problem, it's yours. So that also emboldens people at home in those countries to get a little bit more aggressive. Mikhail Gorbachev, though, wants to open it up through Glasnost and restructure the economy and the political system with perestroika. And he's going to do it rather fast because he realizes that there is stagnation, and if people are dissatisfied, if they can't get toilet paper, they want their government to change. All right, the basic is that. If I can't get eggs, I want something to change. I can't get butter, I want something to change. You know, those basic things. Can't get that, there's problems. And if I can't go down and, and talk to someone about it, there's problems. So he's creating some of these changes, and some people are going to be a little upset about that. 
So it kind of opens up a big old can. You can almost hear the big can go opening up. And, and as he, it is opening up, it's also opening up past tension that leads to maybe things like nationalism. And he might let East Germany and Poland do their thing. But if it's happening inside the Soviet Union, that might be another thing. So these confrontations or these challenges, all these things are going to add to um, collapse of communism. When we see the collapse of communism, it is going to happen fast and furious. You know, I look at this. Oh, I got a little battery. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm at the University of Minnesota when all this stuff is going on. I got excited. And... Um, it is happening extremely fast. Almost every day, almost every day in the uh, newspaper, you're going to see something about what is happening in Romania, what is happening in um, East Germany, what's happening in Poland. And sometimes it's peaceful. Like in Czechoslovakia, they might take out their key chain or keys and they start jangling their keys. You know, basically meaning they want a, a new driver, new driver, someone, a new person in charge. So you can imagine 100,000 people with their keys. That's kind of that's kind of powerful. All right. The Velvet Revolution. All right. Or violent like in like in Romania. Where Nicholas Ceausescu that we saw on the screen is going to get um, arrested and executed. And there's going to be lots of people who are going to be killed in that uprising. Implosion like the Soviet Union. It's just going to implode. And external pressure. It's not so much coming from the West, um, except maybe denying um, economic assistance to the Soviet Union to prevent the hemorrhaging. Instead, we're like, no, we're not going to help out. If anything, we're going to give some words of encouragement to the people of Poland or the people of Lithuania and Latvia and just say, hey, you just do what you got to do. You know, and we just watch it, it happen. So the ending of the Cold War in many ways is going to be fast and furious. It's tied to the collapse of communism. And we're just going to be standing there like, what the heck just happened? What is going on? But it does. It does. All right. The only one standing left is like Fidel Castro is like, okay, where's everyone? Get up to the party a little early, maybe. The reality is there's not going to be a lot of communist leaders by 1990 to show up to the reunion. Okay. Um, that is kind of setting stage here for our assignment, the collapse of communism. All right. And so let's go to Schoology and open it up here. We've got this. This is the big one here. This is going to be helpful. Um, chapter 15 and this other uh, Eastern Europe, Communism and Crisis. That, that will be a good nugget of information to help you with this. So realistically, we're looking for a collapse of communism, this a little attachment, and then the chapter 15 in your book is going to be really helpful. The activity of the South, it looks like a graphic organization. You can work with historical buddies on it, even though it says solo, you can work with historical buddies on it. What we first want to do is look at what happens in Poland, East Germany, and Czechoslovakia. What happens in there, it's going to have a ripple effect throughout Eastern Europe, as well as in the Soviet Union. Uh, and so they, they're all kind of tied here. What we want to find out is, you know, with the Cold War crisis, it was how the Soviets are responding to those in, in, their, in their circle and their control, and they, they come pretty heavy-handed on it. Now it is the 1970s and 1980s. They will have a different approach here, perhaps. So when we look at what were the causes, you know, in many cases, we got these general ideas of what's going to cause, but... If we can find a specificness in these three, that would be great. Um, and then how did the Soviets and the communist leaders uh, react to the crisis or attempt to maintain control? On one hand, it, here's how the Soviets want to react to it. But then what about the local communist leaders? 
All right. So what are and and they may not be necessarily on the same page. The local leaders might want the Soviets to do something, and the Soviets might not give what they want. And then the outcome, what happens? Yeah, we're going to know that Poland, East Germany, and Czechoslovakia will um, eventually go non-communist. But you know, how is that process? You know, what 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 do the changes look like? What are the consequences of that? You know, Poland, Poland may break away, go their separate way, but a consequence is uh, standard of living might not necessarily improve right away. All of a sudden now a dozen of eggs might be like 10 bucks. And like, no way. That's crazy. But we'll see if that changes. And then ultimately here, we also want to look at that issue of nationalism. What's the role of nationalism here? We know nationalism can be very, very powerful, as we saw in the case of like Kosovo and how nationalism had a role in that um, crisis. Does nationalism also play a role in what's happening in these countries? Okay. So uh, this is what we'll work on today, tomorrow, and finish it up on Wednesday. Because that will, that will bring us to the end. I'll say a few things over the next couple of days in regards to the Soviet Union and, and it, its collapse. Um, in many ways, uh, one looks at Mikhail Gorbachev as a, as a tragic figure here. Um, good intentions, perhaps, but uh, consequences. You didn't think the Soviet Union was going to collapse, but it did. Okay? So, and then Thursday, Thursday, if I just segue into that, Thursday is the day in which, you know, I, um, we will put some closure ultimately uh, with it. And so in class, we'll have time say, to tighten up some new sense. If you miss in anything or take that last assessment, which can also happen in class. So it'll be more like a work kind of day on Thursday, last day of the trimester. Okay. So with that, any questions? Any comments, concerns? Yes, you can work with a historical buddy on this. You can. All right. And they can be in this hour or the previous hour. And they can be VLA as well. All right. If there are no questions, um, if they do, always ask. Those at home, you can stay on or exit and have a great day.